Build, what is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. Our next guest, of course, you recognize from out of the space between us, uh, the cult favorite, Secret Circle, and of course, starring in Girl Boss. Uh, this Thursday, her Shondaland ABC hit for the people kicks off its second season. The ridiculously talented and delightful Britt Robertson's in the building. How about that, everybody? We excited? Are you excited? She's excited. We're going to get started in just a second, but before we do, I believe we have a quick peek at the show, so let's go ahead and run that clip. This is a battlefield. You are among the best attorneys in this country, and you fight for justice. I'm your lawyer. I'm a federal public defender. How can my parents not hire me a real attorney? We can do it. Now we do the impossible. I did not kill that girl. Take this assailant down. This is war, and now we fight. Oh, it is that time. Make a ridiculous amount of noise. Welcome to Great Britt Robertson right here. Come on, guys, do it up. That's so nice. Thank you. That's so nice. Oh, thank you for being here and hanging out with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Oh, stop, please. Short for pleasure. I, I was putting it together. I, I like it. I like the vernacular. It's an industry term. It's That's a- correct. How are, how are you doing? Aside from uh, this whole thing being a pledge, how is Britt right now? We're going to jump into this, but I just want to read on you, on your speed, your feeling, your vibe. How's Britt? Well, as I was telling you, I, my vibe is good. It's feeling very forest green from what I've been told today. Um, I, yeah, I'm a happy girl. I'm in New York. I love New yeah. York. Go New York. Go Mets. Um, <laughs> very exciting. One, one person wooed for the Mets. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's like me and you. Me and That's you, it. sister. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm feeling good. Feeling feeling very good. When so Someone says to you that you're you're putting out forest green vibes. How how do you interpret that? What do you think that means? Where, what? I don't know. I always I initially just think of a mood ring. You know those yeah. little mood rings. And I, from what I can remember, I feel like forest green meant like um, cheerful or something like that. Yeah. Like I think it's just like a good energy. I mean, maybe I'm just reading into that. I'm and getting hoping a great that energy. I'm cheerful and happy human. But that's what I feel and it's just it's a beautiful color. I love green. My favorite color is teal, not far off. So I'll take it. I like those shoes. Thank you very much. Little aquamarine with a our seafoam chairs. Yeah, We're doing well. There's a whole motif. That's right. Yeah, I um I used to have I can't remember the term for it, but I had a, a friend in a band who would describe songs by the colors they were he would this sounds mm. purple. This sounds I never I thought he was crazy, but I was jealous because I, I never had that ability. There's a word for that. Yeah, it's, it is, this uh, person today that I was I was speaking to, he he has this ability where he yeah. sees in colors, yeah. which I think is really unique. Um, and I wish I had that myself. Again, I just rely on a good old mood ring, but um, but I like it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. All right, that was fun. Talk to me about this show. Was it? I, <laughs> You're like, all right, get out of here. No, We're done I with feel, colors. Here's the, thing, here's the thing. If I don't, if I don't do my job and keep us on on board with this and talk about the show for at least a little bit, you and I are going to talk about colors and seeing in colors for a little while. We'll get back to that. Please. That's on the agenda. That's all I want. It's gonna happen. No. I promise you that. But uh, I do genuinely, I do love this show. Oh, thank you. I think it's a fantastic show. I think you do a wonderful job That's on it. Nice. And I'm very excited for you that season two is getting ready to kick off. Right now, I got to see the first episode of season. Too. I'm very lucky. Oh, very way. cool. I'll see yeah. it tonight, actually. So you haven't seen it yet? No, I try not to watch the thing, but they're forcing me to. I have like a QA afterwards, so, you know, I'll sit there. They and are forcing you to watch. Is that cry. true of anything you do or this project specifically? You have no, no. You have to be watching yourself back. Everything. I learned a long time ago to not watch anything that I do. I just think that it's it's better this way. I continue to be a happy, healthy human being when not watching, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm amazing, I'm an actor. But as soon as you start watching it, then that's when the downward spiral begins, and you're like, I need to quit. Well, is it because do you become too uh, uh, your own worst critic kind of thing, or is it you have a way in your head that you remember it going, and then when you see it play back, you're like, oh wow, that's not what I thought it was at all? Like, What is it about it that that's such a negative experience for you? It's a combination of both. I think it's, you know, here's here's what it is. You're there, you're on set, you're like, I can do this, I have all the confidence in the world and my ability to do this, and I've worked really hard at the dialogue, and I feel like I got it, and then you do it. And then, um, and then sometimes when you watch it back, you go, well, that's not what I did. And, and what about that other thing that I thought I did that was yeah. really cool? And then also what you start to realize is that maybe you're actually just not very good. <laughs> so it's a combination of trying really hard, not coming out the way you want, and then also possibly just not being very good. Yeah. 
I think that's a really endearing quality to have, though. I'd rather you be the type of person, and I'd rather be associated with the type of person that goes, sees that, and says, I could be better. I, I don't think I'm that good. Mm-hmm. And the person that watches it and goes, look how amazing I am right here. Do you that see how great? That was the best performance yeah. of my career. Exactly. I mean, yeah, but I do need a, I, it would be great if I could have just a taste of that every now and then. A you know what bit. I mean? Just to yeah. keep me going. There's got to be a healthier middle ground, I suppose. No, it's very between unhealthy. Between those two things. This point of view I um, have. Okay, so you haven't seen the first one. You're going to be forced to watch it. Have you finished filming season two? Is season two in the kitchen? You guys are still working done. on it. Done. We're done with it. That's right. Oh, that's exciting. Well, that's the other thing about watching it. Once it's done, it's not like you can go into work tomorrow and be like, okay, yeah. let's pull it together, guys. Let's make this better. So it's just all in the can already. Yeah, so I guess it's 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 a lost cause to look at it and be like, oh, I could do this better. Yeah, that's what season three is for. That's correcto. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Let me ask you a question about this. You know, when you were season one last year, the big question on that you're doing the press, everybody, oh my God, Shondaland, Shondaland, there's pressure, there's this, there's that. You're joining Shondaland. Here we are now, you got two seasons under your belt. Can you identify, do you know, in your opinion, as someone who's been in the business for a minute, Mm -hmm. can you identify some of the 11 herbs and spices that make a Shondaland thing something that we all clamor for information? What's it like on the set? What's it like being there? I like that you call it herbs and spices. Oh, it's special. Um, yeah, no, I can't. I mean, I will tell you there will be times because I feel like I became very chummy with like the writers and creators yeah. of the show. And so there will be times where I like send something on the page and I'll go in and I'll be like, is this a love interest? Is this a potential love interest? Do I need to know this? Am I like, do I need to be flirting in this scene? Do you need like open possibilities here? And they're like, I don't know. I don't have to see. So it can be really problematic because I found myself throughout the season, really reading into stuff that I should not have been. And then ultimately, I mean, we'll find out the season. I felt like every scene that I did, I was like flirting with the person, you know what I mean? We'd be like in a case and I'd be like, hey, I thank you so much for that beautiful closing argument. I think we did a really nice job today. And they'd be like, can we make it less like... um, like your adversary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know, I know. Try that again. Just but I think we're going to be in a love triangle. And they're like, it, 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 just do the role. <laughs> Play the role. <laughs> Britt, for the last time, this one's not a love triangle either. Like, they're just constantly reminding you. <laughs> but I like this one. I really like this idea. We're You're rolling with it. You're I know. But that's exactly what you'd want me to think. I know, like, exactly. I know the Shonda world. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think it would bef- benefit them to tell me these things beforehand because then I'm not just making everything into, like, a romantic love scene. That plays back into the thing we were talking about, uh, not being able to watch it, because you are, you're put in a position where you have to make decisions based on yeah just best guesses. So that can be, I can see how that can be really, like, frustrating to go back and watch and go, man, I wish they just told me I was going to end up doing this or that so I could have uh, calculated better. You but I will say it. this. I will pain. say this. Tell me. An outsider... Uh, you're, you're working with a wonderful group of people that, that you're mm-hmm. right to put your trust into because they put together a hell of a show and you look great on it. Oh, so it does, about. Yeah, it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like you're flying by the seat of your pants just flirting with whatever comes into your field yeah. of vision. That's not it's how it works. Rough. Reads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, talk about coming into season two. I, I had read uh, when you first started the show, you didn't get a lot of time to prepare. You were kind of thrusted into the world, into the role, had to absorb all this quickly. Uh, what about your level of confidence going into season two? How did you feel starting? Much, this? Better. much better. Season two, much better. Yeah. I mean, early on, I was like, um, I was like, okay. I was literally looking at every one of our cast members being like, okay, what kind of resources do you guys have? Do you know anyone? Who do I talk to? What's like? And like, you don't have any time and they're throwing these words at you. And I've got closing arguments that I don't even understand. And I'm just like. But I think for the second season, I learned how to, like, put my focus in the right places uh, instead of just, like, going off on a Google tangent for six hours when I didn't need to. You know what I mean? So it was much easier on the second season because I I understood where I needed to be. How much, as a fan of uh, uh, courtroom procedurals and dramas, the closing statement, the closing arguments. So fun. It's the fun part. It's the part you're all waiting for. Uh, How much time does that chew out of your uh, your preparation? preparation, rehearsal? Are you just in front of a mirror just running monologues? Like, has that the, been the biggest challenge is it's, locking that down? No, no, that's not that. I, I would say, like, the biggest challenge on the show is, like, the cross-examination because it's all, like, really short but quick stuff and you have to fire off these questions yeah, about, like, rhythm. hydrology. And I'm like, what is hydrology? And so, like, that for me is, like, the most difficult part, especially when we get really good guest stars and they all know your li- their lines. And I'm like, a line... 
But the closing arguments, I told them early on, I was like, look, I'm bad at memorizing. I know I'm an actor and that's my gig, but you're going to need to give me like a week to memorize these things. And they're so good about it because they learned their lesson after giving me like two days. And I was like, no, told you, told you. Um, So now they give me like a week and it's just like me walking around Paramount, just like talking to myself 24 seven, doing the bit. So wait a second, let's back up. Did that happen? Did you go and you're like, I'm going to need time. And they're like, you'll be fine. Yes. You're an actor. Yeah. That's what you do. Yes. And then you showed up and you were like, this is really hard for me. And they were like, oh, now we see. They're like, oh, okay. Is she, t- is she teaching us a lesson or like what's happening? It's a real power move. For yeah. You. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And yeah. checkmate. Um, yeah. No, I think, I think what it was is it was like a last minute thing. They had to like rework the schedule yeah. so that, you know, the summations or the closing arguments came much closer in the schedule than they were intending to put it there and then I you know tried my best but ultimately it was like every four lines I was like line line and they were like how are we gonna have, edit this together but so now they're smart I, I never would have known now they helped me out. Yeah, you pulled the curtain back a little bit in movie magic. There I you go. Yeah. Surprise, yeah. surprise. Did you have, uh, it doesn't sound like you had time for this, but I've heard of uh, just like having sort of consultants and, and people from the, the actual mother court and like being able to talk to you. Have you had a chance to have any of those conversations and, and talk to those people? That must be fascinating. Super fascinating. So luckily for us, we had like three days of exteriors where we would shoot here um, in New York for when we would go down to like Foley Square. And, um, and then one of our really genius actors on the show, Jasmine Savoy Brown, who plays Allison, she contacted, who did she contact? It was like someone who knew someone at the Southern District um, and in the public defender's office. And so we were able to like go into their offices and speak to like four or five of them just about their experiences, who they're representing and what kind of cases they have. Um, But it, more fascinating to me was this um, this concept that public defender. You know, I always assume they get these like terrible people who That's do yeah. bad yeah. things, and they have to defend these people. And and I just always assume like they kind of resent that in some way. But in mm-hmm. fact, it's like far from it. I remember they said to me, like, there's only been, like, one or two people that they literally were, like, completely repulsed and disgusted by. Everyone else, you know, they have to do all this digging about their families and how they came to be here and how they got into this situation and whose fault it actually was. And and in that way, they just become completely sympathetic for their situation. And so that I found really fascinating and, and, and ha- helped, our, um, helped our work that we did on the show. Yeah. Well, that, and that's one of the reasons I do love this show is is that it does take uh, a lot of those tropes and throws them out the window. You know, the things that we've been taught by by TV and film and TV over the years of one that the public defender is like this bumbling fool who does uh, you're you're screwed. You got the public defender, and two that the public defender always has to defend the worst person in the world. Right. It's like no, we're getting a much more uh, accurate depiction of uh, of the humanity of it, and the fact that we're seeing both sides uh, of all these different stories and stuff like that. Uh, you know, not just that element, but what else uh, in working on this show has it ever caused you to sort of reevaluate something that you, a preconceived notion you had or something you thought about, uh, be it one of the, the controversial mm-hmm. topics or something like that. I'm sure it's provoked some kind of thought in the, in the two seasons you've done. Yeah. It's kind of everything, you know, every episode, I guess, because I just don't have sort of the broad knowledge of, um, kind of all of these topical issues that were, yeah, that were no, totally. discussing on the show. And so you always kind of think of think of it in this like basic way, like immigration, deportation. If you think about ICE and all these terrible stories that we're hearing about the kids at the border who are like lost with their families, you think, oh my God, this is tragic. But to figure out how, you know, to understand the backstory and how it's all happening, and yeah. you know that stuff, it just open your uh, opens your eyes to every single sort of topic that we cover, voter suppression, which I found fascinating. I had no idea that there are literally people who were hired to like go to the polls and like convince people not to vote. But, you know, that I had no idea. So it just opens my eyes about sort of every subject that we cover. I mean, I thought it was just sort of this like basic uh, idea, which nothing really is in life. Um, but to understand it, understand these topics in its entirety is like very fascinating and and good for me as a human to know. 
Totally. Does it ever, um, do you guys ever get into debate on, on set as well? The whole nature of the show are these two opposing forces mm-hmm. talking about these two different sides. Do you guys ever find yourselves in discussions? Like there's a lot of waiting around on a set. Mm-hmm. Do you guys ever find yourself in time, like uh, differing sides of the fence or just talking about it or just, are you all going around going, I had no idea. This is wild. Like, well, I'm kind you know, I didn't go to school. I was homeschooled my whole life. I didn't go to college. I'm a little, uh, there's a lack of education going on over here. So I keep my mouth shut. Um, because everyone else at work, uh, at, yeah, I know. Can you believe it? We're all dumb dumb. I dropped out of art school, so don't feel like I'm superior or anything yeah. like that. Like it's, I don't. I <laughs> we're don't. both doing all right right now. I read you? that from you, actually. I was like, oh, he's a fellow one. Yeah, he's a fellow dumb dumb. Yeah. No, I, I mean, look, I, I'm, I have, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I know some things about some things, but uh, for the most part, especially in this world, I just try to like open my ears and hear it out. And I've watched a couple of my cast members, like. Yeah. Not get into it, but actually, you know, have some stuff to say that may not be like uh, totally supportive of the other's opinion. Um, but it's always like very healthy arguments in terms of just uh, supporting the topics that we're covering on the show. Um, but I never engage in such. I just head over to Crafty and grab some like snacks. What's your go-to snack at the craft table? Oh, it's all set. Well, I get a Mountain Dew. That's how I start okay. my morning and end my evening. Standard um, issue, or do we do a flavor variant? Are we talking Code Red? Are we talking? That's like disgusting. Mount- I've never heard of such a thing. No, 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 God. no. This interview is over. It's gone rogue. No, I um, I love Mountain Dew. I love the classic. I don't need anything to do with Code Red or any of these other. I haven't touched it in years. When I was in high school, though, I look at old photos and stuff like that. I don't know how, but we sustained on Code Red and Wavy Lay's potato chips. It was a Ooh. gross existence, but I loved it. I wouldn't change it for the world. I don't know how I'm here today to talk about it, but it was all we ate and drank. I like a Wavy Lay. I, a lay. I, 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 I support that. It's a texture in between the ruffle chip and like yes. a Cape Cod, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I so See? agree. I told you we'd go down weird tangents. I think we'd get back to, you know, some common ground here. There we are. There we are. So okay. I like a Mountain Dew. Yeah, that's good. And then, you know, the, the crafty department is amazing, and they will always make me these beautiful turkey and cheese sandwiches. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's sort of my midday point. That's like at 11 a.m. I... <laughs> I'm hesitant to go down. We could do this for a while. Is it a is it a, a press sandwich? Is it a standard sandwich? What are we talking about? I want the detail on the food. Do you? <gasps> What's going on out there? Fine. It's New York. I know. I love it. Somebody texture. Yeah, yeah. It's texture. <laughs> <laughs> um, We're gonna go to the audience in a second, and I have okay, one more okay. question. But I, uh, uh, you don't have to answer about your sandwich. I'm being I'm being ridiculous here. All right. But there was something I did want to ask you about. I, I looked up. Me. I saw this. Uh, I want to talk to you, Little Fig. It said you were writer, director, uh, producer. Yeah. Clearly a passion project. Tell me about Little Fig. What is okay. This? So when we did the first season of For the People. I became obsessed with Wee Sam Kish, who's on the show, and he plays Jay in the Public Defender's Office. I find him a fascinating human being um, for for many many reasons. And I came up with this idea because I've always kind of wanted to like produce and be more on the creative side. But like, no one should give me any chances before I like really fall and fail. Right. So I was like, you know what? I'll fund this myself. I'll like um, I partnered up with my friend Dave Patton, who's a beautiful filmmaker, and I'm a really big fan of his work and so we created something for we sam for him to star in it and he is the sweetest human being for doing this i literally had him like on top of a mountain for six hours with no bathroom like he's the sweetest guy and it's a really beautiful short film that we made um and I sort of directed it. I I didn't. It was all Dave. I I, I will take credit for the producing side of it because cool. it that was like really my big hand in it all. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was a it was it was all inspired by Wee Sam, and he does a beautiful job in it. And so now we're just kind of like putting it out into film festivals. But really, it was just a an experiment to see if that's something I want to do in my life. And coming out of that, that's the question I have immediately: is this is something you've wanted to do? Here you are, you've taken a swing at it. What was the big takeaway? What have you have you as bitten by the bug? so to speak like yeah oh i got to do this again and now i want to do this differently like how did you feel after now that you're showing it to people and whatnot well i learned that i don't want to direct i can tell you that much i just don't have the brain for it i'm more of a like ad producer like i I love like line producing i'm the one i love putting like the pieces together I didn't have a porta potty for Wee Sam, but that's a lesson learned, and I will show up next time <laughs> prepared. We also had like a little, we had like a minor on set, and that requires like a teacher. And at one point, they were like, you know, he needs to break for lunch, and I was like, but doesn't he have grace? And they're like, we don't do, which is like a ten minute period before the lunch is supposed to start. And I was like, you know, actors have grace, and I'm like, no, children do not. They get fed when they're supposed to get fed. There are rules and laws in place. And I was like, all right, grab him a sandwich. Um, but so there's a lot of like things that I need 
needed to to learn along the way. And uh, but I think it's something that I'd love to pursue in the future. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, I'm having a blast talking about all this stuff with you. We do have some audience questions. I want to make sure we have time for them. We get all to right, questions all as right. well. Uh, Kate, how many do I got? I got three. All right. The first one's going to come to us right here on the couch. Let's go for it. Ah. So what are the challenges of the different genres and which ones are the most exciting to work on? That's a really good question. Are you my Mets fan? Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll give you all the time in the world. Um, no, I think the, the challenges would just be, it's sort of like identifying, you know, your genre and sort of playing to those strengths but I think that the the problem that I got into early on when I was like jumping from like a rom-com to a sci-fi to a this to a that to a procedural is that I became too focused maybe on like a genre because ultimately everything is just story and you're just sort of tailoring um you know your character to the story and what's going to best support that for the audience so I think that was my biggest challenge early on is I was taking too much consideration of what box is supposed to be filled here um, because it, it does kind of come down to basics, in my opinion. It's, it's about being as truthful and honest and finding a character that people want to watch and can relate to. So, um, yeah, I would say that. <laughs> That's good. That was good. Did that answer your question? It did. Okay. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank yeah, you, Kate. Thank you. I got what, two more. Next question. Oh, also on the couch. Go Hello. For it. Hey, Brett. Hi. Uh, you are so lovely. Oh, that's nice. And your, your sense of humor is so incredible. Oh, that's so nice. And, 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 so and you're so down to earth. Oh. And I wish someone like you was like so down to earth as you. No question necessary. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> no, I love that. Thank you. Um, so um, what does it feel working with George Clooney and Hugh Laurie and also working with... Um, Brad Bird is one of the greatest directors on the movies that we grew up with. Yeah. Well, Hugh Laurie is one of my favorite people in the entire world. One of the things I love about him is he would, um, you know, like like big famous actors have in their contracts that they need to have certain things in their trailers because we're there for a long time, long periods of time. And his one, his like one big request was to have like a piano in his trailer, which I think is beautiful. Yeah, because he's a pianist and he's like so talented and he, and so I would just love and like, I would, I would go sit on his stoop and just listen to him play. Or even when we were shooting in Vancouver, he would do, like, sets out in um, different places, restaurants and stuff in Vancouver. Um, so I, I just find him to be, like, a really well-rounded human being. He has a wife and kids, and it was, like, beautiful farm. And London I was like, ugh, I want your life. I want to be you. He was, like, very inspirational. And George is, like, kind of the opposite. He's just, like... He's just like a, a little boy who loves to have fun, you know? He just kind of reminds you of like a guy who's just, you know, just like a kid who loves everything. He's full of life and love and laughter. He loves laughing and making other people laugh and telling stories. And he'd walk in here and talk to every single one of you and like tell you about everything that's going on in his life. And I think that's a super endearing quality. And Brad... Um, Working with Brad was one of the biggest challenges of my life because he is such an incredible director and he sees everything in his head and has like a real vision for for everything. But sometimes if you don't totally see his vision, it like takes a second to get get there. But I seriously attribute that experience to being like um, the reason why I became a better technical actor. You know, he he really l lifted me up in that way, and and I'm so grateful for that experience because it has helped me far and wide in my career. So it was it was a wonderful experience, and thank you for your question. That was a wonderful question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, what do I got? I got one more. We got one. More. Oh, also on the couch. What a wonderful little couch. I Go know. ahead. Oh, what a great group you are. Um, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you about you know, the start of like your early career and how was it like auditioning and casting and all that stuff? <laughs> yes, that is uh, that's a gr good question. Actually, it kind of comes back around to what we started off with. Um, so when I first came out, I was like 10 years old and I didn't know any. I had no experience except for like, you know, really small commercials in my hometown and I remember I would go into these auditions and the only feedback that anyone would give me was that like she's too green and I didn't know what that meant my grandmother didn't know what that meant I thought it was like a similar thing like oh you feel very forest green you know what I mean but then what we realized is like she's too new like she feels fresh she's too new she's like green grass I guess is what that I still don't totally understand that saying um but so I didn't you know the first like four or five months of me being in Los Angeles, everyone just kept being like, oh, good job, but you're too green. And I was just like, ah, I don't know what that means. Um, so it was a lot of like 
trial and error, to be honest with you. And it was hard for me to like gain confidence after going on audition after audition. And it's a lot of rejection. It's a lot of like green talk. And uh, and so I th a lot of green talk. And so I didn't totally know, um, you know, I couldn't find my footing very easily. But luckily for me, I was really young, I was super resilient. And I had a grandmother that just like would not stop. Mm -hmm. So she was she really believed in me. And I think that was the most important thing. And um, and time, honestly, like time is what gave me all the confidence in the world. And now I feel like I walk on a set and I know exactly what to do. And I can kind of talk to anybody and get any instruction thanks thanks to Brad Bird and um and so it was just but it, it, it took so much experience you know I've I've done a fair bit of work now at this point and so all of that kind of um led me to where I am now where I have like a little bit of confidence but it was not easy not easy at all you mentioned earlier thank you for your question yeah thank way. you it's awesome uh you know talking earlier about how you're hesitant to jump into those like those conversations on set because there's like this thing where like oh I'm, I'm homeschooled and I'm this I, I'm like there's a part of you that's like I don't have that education so I don't jump into yeah. that um do you feel like that energy uh, was something that propelled you when you were trying to figure things out or do you feel like it was something you had to fight of like was that energy present when you were starting out and like oh I don't have these things I'm homeschooled and now mm -hmm. and now I'm too green mm -hmm. like how, what was that like and how did you navigate that in the beginning well luckily again I was so young but I so I don't think that it was like the lack of education that um that was like holding me back or or giving me sort of like um, any sort of pullback at, at early on, but later in life that kind of became the case. Early on, it was more like lack of experience. Like I was just like a little girl from like a six stoplight town, and I had like you know strange family, and you know, and I'm moving out to LA with my grandmother, and yeah. so I just had like very little experience, and I didn't really know how to navigate the big city of Los Angeles until later on. But I, I think honestly, I'm so grateful for every single step of the way in my life because I think it led me to the point where I am now and I feel like quite honestly like really happy and healthy and like good and confident in, in where I am in my life so I, I wouldn't trade anything and I think it all worked I'm like the luckiest person in the world because it all kind of worked out for me thus far knock on all the wood please um <clears throat> so uh yeah I mean I'm just grateful for all of it you know and whatever it did or however it held me back or pushed me forward whatever Part of it. yeah. it's the it journey all got you here yeah. it's the journey that's badass yeah that's awesome um we're getting the signal we got to wrap it up oh, uh, no. which I know just remember I, we could do this all day and we didn't even get to talk more about colors I really wanted to oh. get into that but uh, that just means you later. have to come back. Yeah, that's right. That's what that means. Good. Um, be it for the next season or the next short film, whatever it is, okay, this door's always open. you got to come back and hang out. This has been too much fun. Yeah. I do want to remind everybody, of course, that season two is kicking off uh, March 7th, 10, 9 central on ABC for the people season two. Uh, you can catch up on uh, Hulu and whatnot on season one if you haven't seen it yet. It's a fantastic show. It's tons of fun. Uh, guys, please make a ridiculous amount of noise. Uh, Britt uh, Robertson right here. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so much. It was a pleasure.